All right. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. 9.30 uh, East time, New York City live. Uh, welcome to class. I forgot what lab is this. I don't count anymore. Doesn't matter, I think. Um, so to, before starting today lesson, uh, you, you perhaps already know that I try to teach not only you, but everyone, uh, especially on, on, I provide my service for free on Twitter and other, I also learn from Twitter, right? I mean, it's like a mutual learning experience, right? So I think, uh, it's a, it's a really powerful tool. Uh, we can all like, uh, we, I mean, uh, people in academia can use to get more information and more knowledge out of, you know, the internet. Uh, so I start actually by, you know, uh, sharing something I would love to see more often, uh, especially by, uh, my students, right? Uh, which is like how to take notes from papers. Uh, the latest papers, there are so many papers, there are like 100, more than 100 papers every day coming out, it's like ridiculous. Uh, so let's see how we can put some order, right? At least for things that are interesting for us. And by doing that, I will share the screen, desktop one. So we go on Twitter first, right? So how do we use Twitter? You go on top right, you just write from uh, me. And then you can do information um, retention, okay? And so you get this post from actually a uh, few hours ago, where I'm pointing out that uh, Yobi Byte he uh, is making some sort of uh, summaries of papers that he's interested in, right? And so if you click here, you get right redirected to Notion that I also talked to you about uh, two two weeks ago, I think. Uh, so here you have like uh, like tags, for example, you know what are the possible topics of the paper uh, when it was created, the author, which is just a list of names, uh, the link, and uh, some comments, right? And then the important part is the following, which is the template. You can also get uh, if you if you check the, the tweet. So you should always start and you know, annotate each paper with a default pre-made template, which helps you in the process. You should start with the why, then you have the what and the how, right? Very few uh, words describing this content, right? It should be like, uh, like a tweet-like kind of amount of words, right? So it's that you just have like a um, condensed version instead of, you know, uh, blah, many lines. It's just a way of, you know, um, engraving the information in, in, in yourself as well, right? Because when you type or when you write, things get memorized better. So I would really recommend you to do something similar with the why, what, how, then the TLDR, which is too long, didn't read, like you didn't read the paper. So you had like one liner or whatever, uh, that is describing the content of paper, of the paper. Then there is this Python block where the main concept, I guess, of the paper is summarized in terms of NumPy, PyTorch, TensorFlow, whatever type of algorithmic implementation. And then there is like uh, the main formulas about the paper, right? So you have the main equation. Finally, you may have some end, no? And, and what? So, and, and then you have like, you know, some final remarks. Also, there is a note that, you know, perhaps is important, right? And then again, at the bottom, you can find the whole list of things, right? I have something similar, right? But I share the type of, uh, I share that I, I have a different type of, you know, metadata, which are the following. So if we go back here, um, I think, uh, quote, tweet, this one. So I have the following met metadata instead, uh, and this is too small, maybe. Let's see if I can zoom. Okay, there we go. So we have topics, I have the URL, uh, what I want to do, the authors are also items, priority in my uh, to-do to list, code, completion, referee, where I found it, the value, how much I, it's worth this paper for me, uh, the project uh, link, if there, uh, so project to my uh, own projects, if I'm working on this project, like I have uh, shared databases and finally the blog, which is important in order to be able to communicate. Okay. So this was the initial remarks that I really care uh, in order to be able to, you know, process and retain information so that you can, I, I, this is an aid for learning. Okay. So if you are not yet structured in your learning from internet, this is going to help you a lot. Not only for papers, I have similar things for other, for other type of media, 
talk about this next time. Enough promotion and you know advertisement. All right. So one more thing. Uh, we talk. Finally, I'm going to be answering the question from I can't remember. Uh, this, this, is a, this is a question I, could, I can't remember who asked it like a few uh, weeks ago. And it's like, why do we need to go in a high dimensional space? And I show you that animation that was very smooth. Uh, instead, today, I'm going to be showing you this other animation. OK, so this is this is a network that has only two neurons per each layer. OK, so the first hidden layer, second hidden layer, third hidden layer, fourth hidden layer, all of them have only two neurons. OK. Then I have a two neuron embedding, which means it's simply a linear projection without the nonlinearity. OK, so the orange one is just a, a fine transformation, whereas the green one are these neurons with the activation function. The first layer, the pink one is going to be my input layer. And the blue one is going to be my soft arc max of the final embedding. And E stays for embedding this linear final transformation of the these neurons. OK. Again, here you can count one, two, three, four, five, six layers, right? There is no nonlinearity, so this doesn't actually count as a layer. Let me show you how this network works. For in this case, we try to um, disparalyze that spiral I showed you last time, okay? But we do that only in the plane. So we only go from 2D to 2D to 2D to 2D to 2D to 2D. As you can tell here, in order to be able to stretch things in a 2D space, I wish you could have simply rotate things in a, in a different, you know, uh, angular velocity, you know, basically given the, like, given the, the distance from the center. Instead, what the network learns is the following, no? which is a really like stretchy way of undoing the warp uh, the, the entanglement, right? Uh, and it's really brittle. Uh, as you can tell, these sharp edges that are coming from the application of the RILU uh, in uh, several, uh, you know, across the network are really like getting some of these areas very compressed, other places completely like uh, not compressed, the other way around, stretched, right? Um, and it was very hard to train. This is an interpolation for each layer. So we had first uh, the first linear layer, and this is the real. As you can tell, the negative part gets squashed back, right? Again, a fine transformation and then a squashing function. You can see how quadrant two, three, and four get cut, right? Again, a fine transformation and then quadrant two, three, and four get zero. And so everything that happened there gets squashed down into the axis. Finally, the last transformation, like linear transformation, like a fine transformation, then final squashing. Uh, some pieces are left off because I'm using a leaky relu, right? And that's the final uh, fine transformation. And this is the embedding layer where I then split with the three planes. These are going to be the SVD decomposition. So we had uh, the first affine transformation and the relu. So we have rotation, reflection, zooming, rotation, reflection, because the uh, determinant is negative, and then the final part, right? And the, so again, here, same, right? So you have SVD decomposition and then reflection if the uh, determinant is negative, okay? The determinant of the rotation matrices. Uh, again, you should have watched the SVD decomposition from Gilbert Strang on his video. There is also three, three blue, one brown on uh, YouTube showing, explaining how uh, eigenvectors and SVD decomposition work. Please have a, you know, binge eat, binge watch these videos because the understanding or getting familiar, not familiar, getting confident of how this transformation happened and why they happen and what how they are made. This is like a very fundamental part that is going to help you develop a understanding of what's going on. OK, in this kind of more complex, I mean, complex so succession of a fine transformation, squash, uh, nonlinearity, right? Rotation, squashing, rotation, squashing, rotation, squashing. OK, so I spent the first uh, 10 minutes giving you, you know, finally the answer, I think, uh, the, of the question, why do we go in a high dimensional space? As you can see, the final result of not going in a high dimensional space in an intermediate layer results in a very, very like a uh, brutal kind of stretch, which was hard, super hard to train. Trust me, I spent quite some time to make 
that animation, not just for the sake of the animation, but for the actual training. Okay, so those are toy examples, but you can understand why uh, some things are hard even with toy examples. Whereas whenever I show you the other network, the first animation, the smooth one, that was going from two to 100 to two to five, right? But again, those two can be ignored. So it was two hundred and five. Okay? This is two, 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 and three. Question for the people at home. How many lines, how many folds can you count in that video at the end of the whole transformation? Okay, you have to tell me uh, next time. Also, there was another question, I think, from last class. You should have told me. I, I had to check those questions. Someone should write down these questions and, <laughs> and, and figure out uh, w what they were. Uh, okay. Someone, some, some TA or grader should take care of these questions I give for, you know, home exercise. Okay. Okay. So what do we talk about today? We talk about the new homework, right? I mean, I'm going to give you more information such that you're going to be successful in, 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 a, in a completing the next homework. And the, this is going to be about recurring neural networks. So last uh, week, Jan started the uh, lesson by talking about parameter sharing. And then we introduce recurring neural network for one hour, and then we move to a second hour of convolutional network. Both of them, both these architecture are sharing parameters in different manner. And so the recurring neural network doesn't necessarily operate on a sequence that is in one dimension, but it can also operate, you know, in a sequences that go in two dimension, right? So it's like a, as long as it's a, it's a grid, no, of, you know, one item after each other, you can apply a, a recurrent network in this direction, a recurrent network in that direction. If it's a volumetric, you know, so it can go in the other direction. And then you process one sample at a time. Similarly to how a convolution can operate, right? But there are some differences. So I'm going to be starting, unless there are questions in the chat, with this uh, lesson of today, with 15 minutes delay. Okay, uh, foundations of deep learning, and that's me. Cool. So today we're going to be talking once again about recurrent neural nets, uh, handling sequential data. Again, not quite, not only at least. You can do sequential data if the data is one dimensional. And when I say the data is one dimensional, I actually mean the domain on which this uh, vector, uh, vector function, no? uh, the vectorial field is uh, working on no? is what is the domain, right? So if it's one dimensional, it's going to be uh, just, you know, the domain is going to be one dimensional. If it's a two dimensional signal, you have two dimensions, three, etc. So this is vanilla classical neural net, no, uh, not, not recurrent. So you have an input on the left hand side in pink, uh, then it moves through a rotation and squashing to get the hidden uh, la layer, right? And so in this case, these single uh, circles represent a vector, okay? So before each circle was represented a single neuron, but they also can represent like a vector neuron, right? So this is like the collection of all the inputs. So X is a vector, the, the pink thing, you want to think it as it comes out from the screen. Uh, so again, input vector X, in pink, uh, rotation squashing, you get the hidden layer, rotation squashing, you get the final output, which is called Y hat in blue. And if you're an electrical engineer, you can think about this as a combinatory logic. The output depends on the current input, and that's it. On the other side, on the bottom, you have now a recurrent neural network. So the differences are two here. Instead of just having X, H and Y hat, we're going to have H of square bracket T, which is uh, telling you it's a signal of a discrete index T. Then you have H of discrete index uh, T and Y hat discrete index T. The, the square bracket for in a computer, in a signal processing, uh, determine the fact that it's a discrete signal, right? Uh, and there is a connection there in the, in the loop of the H, uh, which it's not that crazy as in, oh, I don't know exactly what's the value of H. Is he H? Uh, how, how many times do you loop it there? No. So there is actually a delay module in the, in the loop. And it simply says that the next value of the H uh, equal the, you know, whatever 
rotation of the input plus the rotation of the previous value, right? So we have, again, discrete intervals, right, of T, temporal interval. And again, if you're an electrical engineer, you might be, uh, think about this as a sequential logic, where the output is not only function of the input, but is also function of the state of the system. And so now we introduce the state. The, the system has a memory. Uh, similarly to electronics, we also can reset the system by, you know, turning to zero the internal memory, for example. Cool. Uh, if we use YAN notation, and again, uh, these were neural diagram. YAN uses a evolved neural diagram. We have that, uh, as you can see in the vanilla network here on the top left, in top left, we have this little projectile, no? this bullet a symbol, which is representing a rotation and squashing together, okay? And so you have a rotation and squashing there, rotation and squashing there, there and there, okay? But again, for me are implied, they were implied in the previous diagram. All right, so finally, we, I think I will go quite rather fast on this part because uh, it's, it's just motivation. And I think we spent quite some time about the motivation. So I will try to be a little bit more uh, speedy on this part, okay? So what can we use uh, this recurrent network for, okay? In this case, I will consider applications for one dimensional signals. Nevertheless, you can have applications of RNN for two dimensional, three dimensional, whatever dimensional grid, the domain, right? So the domain is the grid on which values, on which locations you have a uh, vector value, right? Or a scalar, or whatever you want, right? But usually you can think about this number of channel specified at every location in the one dimensional grid, two dimensional grid, three dimensional grid, and so on. Type questions if I speak too quickly, okay? All right. So in this case, uh, something I can think about is gonna be the vector to sequence. I provide a input, which is my first or single vector X, bold X, and then I get a first output, the, the blue one. Then I provide this output back in the, as would be the input, and then I provide a second output. Then I provide the second output back to the input, and then I get a third output and so on, and so on, and so on. And so basically given one vector as input, I get a sequence of vectors. So I can convert a vector into a sequence by using a recurrent neural net, okay? Question for people at home, what could be a application that, you know, uses this kind of diagram, okay? What can be one vector and then as input and then a sequence as output? Guess, generate music and what is the input? So translation, translation, you actually have a sequence as input, right? You have the, 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 the target language, like the, the source language and the target language, right? Uh, okay, so le let, me, let me try uh, to show you this one, right? So for example, my X could be um, an image, okay? So my X can be the, an image or the embedding of an image, like the, the last representation of a convolutional net. And then the network, the recurrent network will be uh, trained in order to produce a sequence of tokens, a sequence of um, representations representing words. In this case, we provide an image or the embedding of, of an image, which is being produced by a convolutional net, perhaps. And then we force the network to output the following, right? So in this case, these are the result of a network on the test set, and you get a person riding a motorcycle on a dirt road. Awesome, right? So the input was a vector, which is the, this image, which again is not provided, is not, okay, you can think about this as a vector, but we also know that this is like a signal, is a signal, which is a, a three channel signal defined on a 2D grid, right? And then this one has been decomposed and hierarchical, like hierarchically decomposed and assembled into getting perhaps, you know, a vector to do classification, but we can go one layer uh, below and get this kind of representation, the embedding representation just before the final layer. And so it can provide that vector and we send it to the recurrent network. 
such that it has some context. And given that context, we're going to be training the recurrent network such that it can produce that sequence of tokens that eventually we can decode into this text. Okay. So we provide this representation of this image, and then we get a person riding blah, a motorcycle on a dirt road. Or in the second case, we get a group of young people playing a game of Frisbee. Fantastic. You know, this is, I think, almost crazy. You provide a image or the, you know, the representation of the context, the representation of the yeah, context or the image. And then the network is able to spit out a sequence of characters or a sequence of tokens. We don't know what all tokens are, but okay. A sequence of one hot encoding vectors representing the words in a dictionary. In the last case, we have a herd of elephants walking across a dry grass field. Sounds that, you know, AI has been solved, no NLP, no captioning has been solved. No, not quite. Uh, let me click through. So sometimes we don't have such accurate product predictions. Okay. So in this case, in the first one, we have two dogs play in the grass. I count three. Two hockey players are fighting over the plaque. To me, it seems correct. Maybe I have no idea. No, there is only one dude here. Third one, a close up of a cat lying on a couch. Looks like a bed. Uh, if we can check worse result, we get a skateboarder does a trick on a ramp. This is a bike. Or a little girl in a pink hat is blowing bubbles. She has a pink hat, maybe red and white. And I don't know if it's a girl, but okay, it's not, there is no bubble there. Or a red motorcycle park in the side of the road. It's not red nor a motorcycle. Or it can also brutally fail, okay? And then we have like a dog uh, is jumping to catch a frisbee. No, it doesn't. It's not jumping, right? So you got the action wrong. Maybe the action may need some, you know, video rather than an image. But I can still see a dog flying, and I can expect it was jumping. Or a refrigerator filled with lots of food, food and drinks. Not quite. Uh, yeah. Or a yellow school bus park in a parking lot. Again, it got something right. Not quite everything, right? So there are some mistakes. And then, and then, anyway, so this was to show you that we can convert one vector into a tan 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 sequence of tokens or sequence of representation uh, that are corresponding to the words you can read here. Okay. And so this is one first application of recurrent net that convert a vector to a sequence of vectors. Questions? No? Okay. So we're going to be going again. I was saying I'm going to be a little bit speedy because we're going to be covering uh, some more stuff uh, that otherwise we get uh, is too rushed. Back to this diagram. And we have the second type of application. Second type of application instead is going to be sequence. Sequence to vector, right? So the other way around. So I represent here my uh, if x, t is just one element, I have like the curly bracket to represent the whole sequence, right? And so t equal one to capital T. Uh, and then, so this is going to be like one, two, three, capital T. Oh, thank you. So Muhammad is suggesting sentiment analysis. That's perfect, right? So you provide like, uh, let's say the Amazon review, and then you're going to say, oh, how many stars you, you got, right? Uh, or I'm going to show you something a little bit niche, right? I mean, I just like it because it's niche, uh, but it's not the best example. I think the sentiment analysis was a best, better one. Again, this is a sequence to vector, right? So we update, at, at the beginning we have a zero state, right? We, we initialize our internal memory, we provide input, then the internal state basically evolves. There is like a trajectory of the internal state that is changing until we get to the final destination provided given that we provide a sequence of input and then that one gets decoded back into this final target okay which is the uh the, the final prediction the, the the blue one here cool so learning to execute this was like mind-blowing when i saw this stuff and still i don't make it doesn't make sense to me like it's <laughs> it's crazy. And also the author are uh, Zaremba and Sutskever. So, you know, also those are two big guys these days, right? They, they were also, you know, this is awesome. I think I like it. Uh, so the input is the following. Okay. It's a sequence, which is J equal 8,584. 
for x in range 8, j plus equal 920, b equal parentheses, I don't know why, 1500 plus j, print, double parentheses, b plus 7567. The target is 25,011, okay? So, although here the output can be thought as actually being a sequence of characters, in this case, I'm just, uh, you know, supposing that it's a, just a scalar, okay? Um, so, the network learns how to execute programs without executing them, okay? And this is nuts, okay? So, you provide a sequence of text describing a Python program, and you train a neural network to actually give you the answer of the program, okay? This is like non-stick, mind-blowing to me. Isn't for image captioning first, um, we need to extract its feature features. In the case of, um, we have many features that we feed into the RNN. Yeah, so I was saying before that for the image captioning, you may want to use a network perhaps that you have trained for classification or in any unsupervised manner that we see in a few weeks, which has already learned how to extract a hierarchical decomposition or a hierarchical summarization of the features, right? Uh, so yes, uh, whenever you have an input, which is a signal over a 2D grid, you're going to be using a convolution in order to extract information, okay? Once we have this higher level of representation, this embedding, we can provide that vector to the recurrent network such that it can operate on vector rather than on signals, right? Uh, although that the recurrent network will operate on a one-dimensional signal, right? That is the sequence of items. So yes, so you're gonna be using multiple architecture stacked together, right? So it's gonna be like, you know, you, you, you build your final model as like a construction of multiple Lego blocks, okay? The other example here, moving, uh, coming back. So that's a Turing machine with a neural net. We also have Turing machines. That's another article. This is just, you know, training a recurrent network to get out a approximate ver ver version of the output, I think. Uh, not entirely sure if it's a Turing machine, this one. There are Turing machines. Uh, someone did train a few Turing machines with a neural net. This is another example. And, you know, similarly, you have an, a different uh, final output, okay? Again, this is also mind blowing to me. Back to the previous diagram. We cover vector to sequence, sequence to vector, what's missing? For example, we have sequence to vector to sequence, okay? And this used to be the uh, standard, uh, the, the, the state of the art manner to perform translation. Uh, this should be an easier problem compared to NLP, right? Uh, which one? Write the whole sentence, please. I can't, I don't know what you're talking about. All right, so this is like the classical learning to execute. Um, it's, it's, it, I think it's like uh, natural language processing, right? You, you're learning, you're processing. Oh, okay. I guess it's non-ambiguous, right? I mean, the Python code it has a deterministic output, whereas natural language processing, uh, like natural language is hard to actually get, you know, uh, it correct answer because there is no such thing as correct answer right in languages there are you know different kind of uh shades or how do you call them hue of possible interpretation of the meaning yeah so with the python one would be like a deterministic result right unless you have random <laughs> np dot random or whatever all right moving on here back to sequence to vector to sequence right which is there is a intermediate um uh, representation, which is a vectorial representation, which it has condensed the temporal information. So you have a temporal information, you condense it down in a vector, which I like to call it concept vector. It's a vector representing the concept of that, you know, expanded version, temporal version. And then given that context, the, the what did I say, I call it the concept vector, I get it back to boom, expand it back in a, in a temporal domain, right? And so we have this kind of temporal collapse or temporal compression, I would like to, to call it, right? So you compress <laughs> time to frequency domain. No, no. Uh, or, uh, to learn that, I don't know. I don't think it's necessary to learn that the time to, to frequency domain. But the point here is that you can collapse the time and then, you know, in a 
and you convert that representation, right? The temporary information is converted into like a, uh, let's call it descriptive information, right? And as was using the same name as we used yesterday. And so then the descriptive information back is converted down in the temporal information, right? Uh, yesterday we saw that the spatial information was converted by a convolutional network into a descriptive information, right? Which is like this. And then also if we're using something called an autoencoder, we're going to be getting this um, descriptive information back to the uh, spatial information. Similarly here, we have like temporal information collapsed in this descriptive information and then back to this other temporal information, okay? Cool. So I told you already, this is an example, classical example of translation where we used to condense this first source uh, sentence into like this... Uh, uh, meaning, uh, sorry, the meaning of the, the source sentence into this concept vector, and then you unpack it in a different language. And you may have different decoders for different languages too. And so something, once you train this system to perform translation, you end up with very interesting uh, algebraic structure of the, um, of the actual uh, embedding space. And let me show you what these actually mean. So here I show you a few diagrams where you can see the uh, PCA of the uh, hidden representation. And there are clusters, right? There is going to be a green cluster here, a cyan cluster and a, a yellow cluster over here. Let me zoom in a little bit. So the green one was all the months. All months are nearby uh, in the same location, right? Which means they are semantically replaceable, right? So if you swap a month for another in a sentence, it doesn't, okay, it changed the meaning of the sentence, but it's not going to be grammatically incorrect. Um, you know, it snows in December, it snows in August. Maybe if you're on the other side of the, of the globe, right? Uh, it's, even, it's even semantically correct, right? But nevertheless, grammatically is correct, nevertheless, right? Uh, and so these are their embeddings, they are their, you know, the encoding. It's really similar because they can be swappable, right? Similarly, in this other case, we have, you know, all temporal uh, embeddings, right? So we have uh, one to three months, two days before, for nearly two months, over the last two decades, blah, 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 right? So all of these can be swapped in and out without, you know, breaking the language. They will change the meaning, but nevertheless, they have their representation, which is very close to each other. Okay. So this is super interesting. Finally, we have some, as I was mentioning before, algebraic structure that this space, uh, learn, which is, for example, if you have like, uh, the distance between king and queen is the same as man to woman. And so if you do, um, king minus man, you get here plus woman. So king minus man plus woman, you're going to get uh, down to this point here. Okay. And so, I, I don't know, I think this is like uh, super interesting how you can actually end up getting math or like geometric representation of the words, right? So there's a semantic space. Now you can perform operations or the fact that the distance between walk minus walking, which is this arrow is going to be the same as swam, swam minus swimming, right? So the distance that is connecting the uh, present continuous to the past is the same as the, again, present continuous and past in this for the other verb. Okay. Although this isn't, it's an even irregular word, right? And then similarly, you have that, you know, these, you know, vectors connecting the, 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 the country with their capital are all, you know, the same. If you do like uh, Spain minus Madrid, Italy minus Rome and Germany minus Berlin, all of these vectors have very, very high degree of, you know, alignment. Uh, what are these axes here? What does each axis represent? In this case, these axes are just for pictorial representation. We are just talking about the um, embedding of, you know, we are talking about the hidden representation. So if I go back to this diagram, uh, each point in that vector, in that, in that dimension, in that picture there is basically this vector 
uh, over here, right? So the last hidden layer. So you, you provide bam, 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 the three inputs. You have this hidden layer over here. And then given these three hidden layers, you know, in whatever dimensional space, let's say, I don't know, 256, uh, in this 256 dimensional space, you're going to have this algebraic structure. And that was just a pictorial representation of the first three components, let's say, of these vectors. Okay. So just for the representation, it's not actual, uh, it was not, you know, uh, correct. It was just for intuition. But the other diagram, the one I show you here, these are like a PCA, right? So these are the two principal components of the embedding layer, the hidden representation. Finally, we are almost on time for this part. Finally, we had the last one, which was mentioned in the chat here. Uh, these are three dimension reduced outputs. They are not outputs. Those are the hidden representation. Okay. And it's not even reduced. Those, those were, uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, just, you know, pictorial representation, but yeah. The final one is this one. While you provide an input sequence, you're going to get a output sequence. This is going to be in the homework. Okay. Uh, what's an example here? Like if you're old as I am, you might remember the T9. Okay. On the Nokia phone, as you type things, the phone tries to predict what you're saying. Oh, we have also something similar right now, I think. Uh, so there is a predictive algorithm trying to tell you what you were actually typing in order to, uh, you know, have less to type, but I guess no one types anymore anything. There is like a swipe, no? So why would you actually <laughs> type now things? We have screens, right? On the, on the, on the mobile phone. Uh, but once, you know, upon a time, we actually have keys. So <laughs> it was a pain to, to type everything down. And because you actually had to press multiple times, not to press C, you had to do A, B, C, you know, with the number two, no? Or if you want to press the S, you had to press number seven, one, two, three, four, no? <laughs> I don't know if you remember this stuff. Um, yeah, that's crazy, I think. And something I can show you here is going to be this editor, which has been trained. Uh, yeah, you didn't have to look, I know. I will remember, no? Even at. <laughs> yes, you're right. You didn't have to look at the keyboard. Now you had to look at the keyboard before we actually could type messages without watching by using the tactile feedback, right? <laughs> Good point. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. So let's say we train this system on um, um, on science fiction books, okay? And so if you train the system on science fiction book, you're gonna get something like that. You type the rings of Saturn glittered while the harsh eye two men look at each other. Mm, what's going on here? They were enemies, but the server robots weren't what? <laughs> I don't know. So if you're not a very proficient writer or you have maybe not many ideas about how to write a new novel, just train your neural network, your recurrent neural network on the latest novels and you're going to get your assistant providing you, you know, tips for your, <laughs> for your new novel. Okay. Okay. Jokes aside, uh, you can find more about this one on, on, uh, on, on GitHub, right? So this is there. Uh, something else, which is so, so interesting, but it's not a recurrent network, still text generation is the following. Uh, and this is, I just leave it here for a second, such that you can screenshot or whatever, you can watch the recording later. And the content here, it's ridiculous because it seems like it's written by a human. It's not right, but it's crazy. All right, moving on. Finally, we might even end, end up on time today. How do we train this recurrent neural network? Okay. So is this you know recursion the fact that your current value depends on the previous value any crazy thing no everything is just very plain uh back propagation but then how do you handle the fact that there is you know time dependencies okay there is no time dependencies here uh, there are discrete interval time right so we're going to be simply unrolling the time we're going to be getting a network which is going in two dimensions right uh, like, sorry, in the in one dimension. So we expand the network, but we have to keep in mind that we are going to be applying parameter sharing. Well, that, what do I mean? Okay. Now I'm going to tell you what I mean. All right. So this is the classical network. Those are vector, right? I have the input, the hidden and the output on top. 
And these are the final, the, the normal equation. We have the hidden layer is going to be the squashing of the affine transformation of the rotation of the X. And then you have the Y hat is going to be the squashing of the rotation of the hidden. We know this stuff. And enter the recurring neural network. So what are the differences? I think very tiny difference. So now we have, these are the equations, uh, which may look a little scary, but they are, I'm going to be going through right now, right? Right now we have that the, H, the hidden layer, are the temporal index. Now these are indexes, not variable. Temporal index T is going to be the squashing function of this WH, which is exactly the same WH as before, of a new vector, which is not just the X vector, but is the X concatenated also with the previous value of the hidden layer, okay? Plus the translate, the, 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 this, the bias, no? The, um, offset, whatever you want to call it. Moreover, I'm going to be starting somewhere, right? So whenever I start, we said we count from one. So I have one, two, three, four. Whenever I start with H of one, we're going to have to input something here for the H of zero. So I have to define H of zero is going to be zero for me. I just reset to zero. Why zero? Because it's just, it kills basically everything that is in the multiplication. Um, this notation is here for two reasons. So the first one is just to make it similar to the previous notation. We still have the WH times a vector, WH times a vector. Uh, and also the second reason is that if you have a vec this one, this, this multiplication, you just get it in one go. But you know, unless uh, otherwise, usually you can see this one as unpacked in multiple uh, multiplications. You can write this as, you know, so the WH is going to be the concatenation, horizontal concatenation, row concatenation of the WHX and WHH. And then this is going to be the vector, right? So you have matrix, matrix, vector, vector, which is the same as doing matrix, vector, matrix, vector, right? Uh, right, so this is the same as writing WHX times X plus WHH times X, H of T minus one plus B. Finally, you have that the output is simply the squashing of the affine transformation of the hidden at the time t. So no big deal, right? So the last equation is the same. The first equation is the same. The only difference is the fact that there are indexes, uh, discrete indexes t. And now we have that the input is no longer just the input, but it's the input and the state of the system. The state of the system is represented by the previous uh, time step hidden representation. Jude, could you explain the initialization of H0? So I just have to start somewhere, right? So I have to do something with the memory. In your computer, you cannot read, if you write a program in C, you cannot read a, a location of memory before you actually written, have, have written anything. Well, you can, but you're gonna get garbage out of it, right? And so if you want to write something or ac accumulate something, right? Uh, you want to, let, let's say, so if you want to, you know, start a, how do you say, how do you call it? Like a, a counter or whatever, no? You, you write i equals zero, and then you have i plus equal one. So you, you start somewhere, zero, and then you start accumulating things. If you start summing to i and i was not, never initialized, then you have no idea what you're gonna get, right? So we def define by, I mean the value y all zero, so I just zero out my memory. I, at the beginning, I have no better knowledge no, to, to what to put in the memory. So I just you know, erase my memory and I start using, I start putting things inside the memory. Th that's why you initialize usually variables to zero or whatever, right? So there is no main reason uh, to initialize to zero. It's like zero, zero padding. No, zero padding maybe is okay because we subtract the mean and in, the, in the representation, but okay. So no answer, maybe a, a confusing answer. So how to train this stuff? We simply unroll it in time, right? So I have a replica at t times t minus one, a replica at times t, a replica t at uh, t plus one, right? And then how do we how do we train, right? So you have like here we're gonna have like um, a loss function, right? And we go this stuff inside here. And then we have a loss function perhaps with this one here. So we go inside here and then a loss function over here 
or maybe a loss function that has all these three components together. And then you're gonna get a gradient that goes down in this direction. And then this gradient also goes down in this direction. And also this gradient goes down in, uh, you know, against all the arrow, right? So whenever you have back propagation, you want to go in the direction opposite to every arrow you have here. And you keep going, right? Uh, so, and then, yeah, you're gonna get the gradients down here, that goes down, then you have a gradient go down here and down here. And then finally you have the gradient goes down here, okay? Possibly you're gonna get a gradient coming down from this, from the future, and possibly also you're gonna have a gradient going to the past. And so this is the back propagation through time, which was a nightmare. Maybe if you had to code this by, by hand, we don't ask you to code this by hand. Uh, you know, with PyTorch, we, we simply get back propagation. What does back propagation do in PyTorch? Can you remind me? This is important part, right? Why is important this part? What did we say that back propagation do? Are you with me? They compute the gradients. Okay, someone is actually correct right now. Muhammad is correct. Accumulates gradient. Why do you accumulate the gradient, right? Because once you go down here, you computed the gradients of this one, right? With respect, the, the loss with respect to this one, when you compute down here. But then also when you go down here, you want to still add on top of this. If you're simply computing the gradient, you're gonna be killing what was done previously, okay? Instead, by you know uh, accumulating, you simply refine what is this value, right? Because again, all these Ws here, maybe I should change color. All these values here are the same uh, parameter, right? So whenever you compute the gradients, those are the same parameters shared by all these networks over time, which are the same network. And so whenever you compute not only yeah, this one, right? Also, when you go down in this direction, these uh, gradients are gonna be accumulated here and here and here. So the, the given gradient will get how many calls? So if I look at this uh, item over here, how many updates will this gradient have in this diagram? Can you count? Type in the chat. No, it's not three, it's more than three, right? Why is it more than three? For sure, five, yes. So three of here, two for this one, plus one of, oh, six actually, right? Yeah, six. So there are six updates to this gradient for, for, for with this parameter, okay? So this is the back propagation through time, accumulation of multiple partial derivatives due to the fact that, you know, it's a, a weight sharing network, okay? Okay, um, moving forward. Uh, a training example, okay? So let's say here, I'm gonna have this uh, sequence of symbols. I just put letters such that we are a little bit easier. It's a bit easier to ref refer to each of these. And so I'm gonna be batching this. I'm gonna be splitting A, B, C, D, uh, until the F. There's the first batch down here. Then G, D, 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 D. So I have different columns representing the, my data, right? And so whenever my batch size here is number four, so I split my entire sequence in chunks, four chunks, and then I put these chunks, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in a packed manner. And so in this case, how do I train, let's say a language model, which is gonna be trying to tell me in advance what I'm gonna be saying given what I said. So if this is my input batch, which is gonna be ABC or GHI or MNO or STU, I will force my network to predict, so the, the you know, the back, back propagation period is number is three in this case. I'm gonna be trying to predict the fact that if I provide ABC, I want the network to say BCD. So when I provide A, I want to have B. The network, the network should tell me B, no? When I provide B, I want the network to provide C, and when I provide C, then I want the network to provide D, and so on. And I have in a batch, so G, uh, the network will be forced to provide H. I provide H, the network is forced to give me I. I provide I, the network is gonna be forced to provide J. 
So how does it, how do we train this network? So I have my input here. I provide it in a recurrent network. I have my first output. Second output, I have the uh, hidden representation from the previous time interval provided to my network. And then I have the second output. Then I have the third input, given the representation of the previous state, I have the you know, final uh, output there. What is this stuff? Why do I put a slash arrow here? Anyone? I end the state, right? So I had to stop somewhere. I, I took my three items, then I don't, I don't go inf to infinitum, right? So I just have these little chunks. And also have a slash on the left-hand side. So what does a slash mean? So first of all, I have H0 is initialized to zero, but I also have no gradient coming from the past and no gradient going to the future. Because if you have, if this stuff keeps going, then you have a computational graph which is becoming longer and longer and longer, right? So this stuff, you know, you run out of memory. So you have to chop your sequence and then you learn by on chops on, on, on parts of sequences, right? So you go forward in the sequence, then you run back propagation back to that sequence. You get the next sequence, forward and backward, next sequence, forward and backward. You cannot do forward in the whole sequence and then backward because there is no more memory in your computer, okay? I wish you could do, you cannot. All right, vanishing and exploding gradients. You will be uh, asked this stuff in the, in the homework. What happens here, I'm just giving you the intuition here, is that in a recurrent network, you have your first input, which gets you know, lost through the network. So whenever you run back propagation, the back propagation doesn't really get to the input layer. Whereas if you use something called a gated neural network, which is going to be a similar drawing where instead we have these symbols that are like mouth. If the mouth is open, the signal will go forward. So mouth open, you have the white moving over, over here. Mouth open, the, the, the white moves forward. Mouth open, it moves forward and so on, right? So mouth open here and then you get the signal to go to the output. And then again, mouth open, mouth open, mouth closed, so nothing goes up and then mouth open, it goes up, right? And then it stops here. So there is no more propagation of the state. And so this is like basically a reset, right? And so here you can tell there are four recurrent neural network. Uh, there is a first neural network that is converting the input to go here. Uh, so hold on. So the first input, the first neural net, recurrent net is gonna be the fact that uh, this value over here is function of the input, but it's also function of the previous value, right? So this first neural, uh, recurrent net. Second, re second recurrent net is the one that governs this open mouth, which is the input mouth. Then there is this open mouth here, which is the uh, recurrent network that governs the forget gate or remember gate, I will call it instead. And then there is a open or closed mouth here. Uh, so there is a third, fourth neural network here governing when to open or close the output map, uh, the output mouth. So there is an input, there is a remember, and there is an output mouth or recurrent network plus this recurrent network, the main one, right? So these three items here are called gates, or I call them mouths, but they are gates. The mouth can be open or closed. The gate can be open or closed, right? But since it's circular, to me, it looks like a mouth. Anyway, so there are three recurrent network plus the fourth, which is the main one. And uh, one of these implementation in this case is going to be called the long short term memory, which was made by this dude over here, uh, Jürgen Schmidhuber and his student. And so here I'm going to be representing to you uh, this uh, equation, which are the one we show you before for the recurrent network, which have this kind of neural diagram. Okay. We use now different diagrams, diagrams with Young with those kind of projectives, but this is what I used to be drawing no? with a neural diagram, which is representing this equation. Instead, in this other side, I'm going to show you the equation for the LSTM. Don't scream, don't get disappointed, don't, don't, don't get too crazy, although no one is screaming. So, okay, maybe you're fine or maybe you're not listening, but it's okay. Um, okay, I'm joking, right? Uh, 
X. Okay, there you go. So in this case, these equations are not too crazy, as in these are simply represented by this circuit, okay, and the, this um, uh, neural neural circuit, okay. What does it mean? What do they do? So I give you this one, and then we see the notebook. Then we say goodbye. This is the first input gate. So I told you there are three mouths. There is the input mouth or input gate. Then we have the don't forget. So the remember gate. Uh, it's called forget. It's wrong. It's called remember, right? Don't forget or remember because it it works in the opposite logic. So I will call it remember gate. And then we have the output gate, which is determining whether something goes out or not. And these gates have the you know particular part that this the uh, nonlinear function is going to be this sigmoid. Okay, sigmoid goes from zero to one, so you can have like a multiplier. Multiply by zero, you you kill the, the signal. You multiply by one, the signal goes forward. Whereas the main neural net, which is this uh, green one, is this item in the center here, which has a hyperbolic tangent, for example. All right. Okay. Moving on. How does it work, the, this LSTM, right? So the output can be controlled and turned off or on. As I told you, if the sigmoid can be one or zero, let's say, you know, a discrete value, I can think as if I, my internal final representation is purple and then the sigmoid is zero, zero comes out from the multiplication. If my sigmoid instead is green, then the multiplication sends me forward the, you know, whatever internal representation. That is, that's quite straightforward, I think. Then on the other side, we have the memory, uh, controlling the memory, right? So how do we reset the memory? To reset the memory, you want, so you have an internal state that is this purple one, but, and you have a previous cell, which is this green, uh, blue color. If you put a zero from the input, you're going to have that the input get multiply by a zero and nothing goes forward. Similarly, if you put a zero in the memory, you're going to get a zero there. Summing two zeros, you're going to get a zero in the internal memory. So this is how we reset. Okay. Similarly, if you want to keep, you don't want to get any input. So you zero the input, but then you simply have a one in the memory such that everything keeps flowing and you're going to keep the same blue content. Finally, we can write something new by sending one in the input gate such that the one gets multiplied by the purple and you're going to get the purple, but you don't want to keep remembering or use anything from the memory, right? So in the memory, you're going to put a zero such that you kill whatever you have in the, in the memory. And then finally, you're going to be writing purple in your cell. And that was the lesson. I'm going to show you where the notebooks are. I don't want to keep the annotations. And so I show you where the notebooks are and what we do here. Okay. So in the notebook, and we're going to be going to CD work, GitHub, PDL, and then we do Conda activate PDL. Okay. And then we have Jupyter notebook. These things are going to be turning on. I move the notebook to the right hand side. And then we're going to be going to the number sequence classification, number eight. And the bar is again in my face. Go away bar. Okay. Okay. So what do we try to do here? All right. I can't see. There we go. So here we have four types of sequences. Okay. These sequences are going from a length of 100 to 110. I'm going to be executing everything such that I can talk while this stuff is training. Okay. Again, you should be spending a couple of hours per notebook when one we cover, once we cover this in class. Okay. So I here I just show you the things actually are running. I'm you have to spend and get familiar with all the code yourself because that you know takes time. I know. So here a sequence goes between 100 and 110 symbols, right? So there are 100 to 110 sequ uh, symbols, and then at two different locations, T1 and T2, you're gonna get T1 can be from 10 to 20, and T2 can be from 50 to 60. You're gonna get two identifiers. 
Okay, identifier can be XX. Oh, well, you I'm flipped, right? I'm mirrored. So you can get XX, XY, YX, and YY. Okay, or well, the other way around XX, XY, yeah, YX, and YY. Given that you have this possible four combination, you're going to get possibly four different classes. You have Q, R, S, and U. Okay, so we're going to be doing sequence classification based on these two markers which may happen, the first marker happens between 10 and 20, and the other one happens between 50 and 60, okay? And in, in, the, in between, there are destructors, and those destructors are A, B, C, and D, four more symbols. So we have A, B, C, and D in the whole sequence, plus these two markers, right? Our sequence starts with a B for beginning, and this is like the sign language for the B, and then you have the E here for the end, and this is sign language for the E. So you start from B, beginning to E, ending, right? You have A, B, C, D mixed randomly inside the, the, the sequence. And then you have these two markers. You want to be able to classify the sequence, sequence as being Q, R, S, or U, based on what you have, okay? I hope it's clear. So here I'm going to be showing you, so how many symbols do we have? Who did count? Beginning end, so there are two. A, B, C, D, there are four more, so there are six. Plus X and Y, eight, right? So you have eight symbols in total. So whenever we're going to be using uh, the, the converting these things, we're going to be having uh, in total eight symbols, right? Uh, four and eight. And in this case, we have all zeros here. Why, why we have all zeros? We had to pad because we, we train with batches and then one of the sequences actually uh, was you know, shorter. And so, because again, the sequences have different lengths. Okay, okay. So an example of, you know, from the data set, we have B from beginning, B, destructor, capital X, C, Capital X, so XX is going to be the first type, right? The Q. And then you have CB, destructors, E for end. So this was a Q sentence. And we train the network to predict Q. So Q are going to be encoded in a, uh, one hot, as you can see over here, right? So Q is the first one. And you have 0, 0, 0, 0, right? So we train, we train with the classical cross entropy, it's a classification task of a sequence. So in this case, I have a simple uh, recurrent neural network, which is using torch and then recurrent neural network. And then I simply uh, have my forward, which I send my input X to my recurrent neural net. In the other case, I have a simple LSTM, which is going is using this torch and then LSTM. And then here, similarly, I pass my uh, H to my LSTM. Uh, we have the training with the five steps. Remember, we have the forward step. We have the uh, loss computation number two. We have number three, zero grad. In this case, because we're going to be processing with the backward, which is going to be computing all those, you know, accumulation of the partial derivatives. And then finally, you have the step in the optimizer. Uh, testing loop the same, basically, without the back propagation. And then we put all together. And we have a train and test function that is just running through uh, these things, right? And so I'm going to be showing here first with the easy setup and how they train, right? So I train both the RNN here and then later I train the LSTM. Let me unzoom a little so you can see the whole length, the whole lines. And so in this case, we have that the loss goes down and the epoch for the, uh, for the you know, accuracy, you can see that it goes up. Maybe we just train for nine epochs, right? Or 10 epochs is not enough to get everything uh, up to there. Uh, if I train instead 10, 10 epochs with the LSTM, you can see that we reach 100%, okay? But perhaps we should have just trained longer, right? The recurrent neural net. And so if you train longer the recurrent net, actually it, take, it gets up there, right? It takes a little bit more time. But then what you want to try is going to be changing this from easy to hard and see how they compare. And, you know, LSTM with 100 epochs, you get that after within 20 epochs, we are already at 100% here. 
we were already at 100% in this case after 10 epochs in this first case, right? So it, it trains faster, but nevertheless, you remember now in this LSTM, you have uh, four networks one into each other. All right, so model evaluation here, we can see, and then I'll let you go, how the uh, sequences get classified. And then I can also visualize uh, a few of these models here. And so in this case, you can see how whenever uh, this X is encounter, one specific unit of this LSTM changes from negative value to positive value. And so here we represent this change. That was it. Okay, I, I was running perhaps a little bit today. I am over time again. Uh, I hope it was somehow clear. Uh, this is going to be uh, tested again in this first homework. Uh, it's in second homework we're going to be sending to you. If there are more questions, I will take them on the campus wire. Thank you for being with us, and I see you next time. Okay. All right. I hope you enjoyed the class. And I was not running. I. Let me know if it was too fast, okay? All right. Bye. Bye-bye.